might make a start. So welcome everybody. Um, this session is on how to develop and deliver a tailored sustainability strategy. So uh, the webinar is being recorded and you can get a copy of the slides afterwards. Uh, just for background, my name is Imogen Player. I'm a sustainability consultant with Action Sustainability. So my background is in sustainability strategy and performance management. And for Action Sustainability, you might have heard us, um, uh, another name in terms of the Supply Chain Sustainability School, because we deliver um, that. Um, but we also obviously do consultancy services for other clients as well. In terms of the agenda for this webinar, I'm going to take us through a very um, brief introduction and background to uh, what is sustainable development, how do you develop your strategy, what's the process for going through it, and how would you then tailor your strategy. And we've got on the call Ian Bruce, Operations Director, and Grace Wilson, Technical Apprentice. So we'll be passing over to them later and hearing actually from HE Sim as to what they've done to develop and deliver their sustainability strategy. So there's a Q&A box at the bottom. Please do put in any questions that you've got. We'll have time for some questions after Ian's presentation and after Grace's, and then for any other questions at the end as well. So do use that Q&A box there. So I'm just gonna um, cover uh, briefly now is around understanding, understanding sustainable development. So what I want to do first of all um, is ask you as the audience to get uh, to understand what it is that you know about sustainability strategy. So if you can go to Menti, so open it up in a tab on your on your browser, on your phone, on your iPad, it's just entering www.menti.com. You'll be met with um, a code. So the code is on the screen here. You need to input that code, which will take you to the right questions. The code is 2703. 2412 and Billy will be putting the code in the chat box as well so you'll be able to see there. I'm going to um, change the slide onto the Menti slide now um, but it will, it will still say the code. Um, so make sure you don't disconnect from the webinar, you still need to hear what I'm saying but I just want to get um, some questions over to you. So if I just open up Menti. So the first question is what does the sustainability strategy mean to you? And just a reminder that the, uh, the code to access this question is in the chat box. So what does the sustainability strategy mean to you? So I want to get, um, just let, let me know a couple of words. What does it mean to you? Are you a beginner in your, in your journey? Um, have you ever um, thought about what a sustainability strategy is before? Have you already got a sustainability strategy, but you want to understand more about it? Is sustainability strategy a brand new word uh, and phrase to you? What do you think it means? Does it mean um, what you're doing in your um, in your organisation, you might be doing things already around carbon, um, around community, around the environment. Um, if you just put a couple of put a couple of words in there as to what you think that is, because it would be really great to understand what your knowledge is um, so far, and then how we can uh, bring out what you need from this webinar. So we've got uh, a couple of words coming in. So net zero, yep. So beginner, that's perfect. So this is will be brand new to you as well. Great. So we've got, yeah, exactly. So it's not just uh, around using resources now uh, and, and thinking about sustainability now, but it's about thinking about it in the future as well. Staff engagement, improving, balancing, not compromising, journey. Exactly. It's, it's a journey, so which is what we'll be touching on. And we'll be obviously hearing from HE Sim around what their journey is. OK, that's brilliant. Thank you. So the next question is I can see some of you've gone on to it already. Does your organization have a sustainability strategy? Yes, no, don't know, or we're in the process of developing it. So for those that might already have one, obviously you can use this webinar to get an understanding of what HE Sim have done, see how you can improve your own strategy. And um, for those that you know, uh, or know or you don't know, or you're in the process of developing it, this is obviously a perfect webinar for you to understand what is it that we need to do to develop, or um, do we even need to just understand within our organization has this, is this already, does it already exist? So last few seconds for anyone to respond. So that's perfect. So we've got, we've got a nice mixture, mixture there of people that have already got one developed um, and then are also developing. Brilliant, thank you. And then the final question before um, I then go back into the presentation is, 
what are the biggest blockers to developing and or delivering your strategy? So these could be personal blockers um, or they could be organizational blockers. And um, it could be, as we saw on that previous slide, so for those that um, are in the process of developing or you don't know if you've got one um, or you haven't got one, what stopped you personally or as an organization from developing your strategy and then if you're at the other end the other spectrum those seven or eight of you that said that you already have a strategy what blockers are you finding that is stopping you from implementing and improving your strategy so far lack of resource lack of knowledge costs coming out a few times there awareness legal obligations so competency and understanding and knowledge is coming out a few times there as well as uh, as well as resources whether that be cost or time so there's definitely a, a few themes coming out there well hopefully uh, what we'll come on to later and what you hear from ian and grace will help you to understand how one client in particular how he sim have um, and are continuing to overcome these types of blockers so thanks very much for answering that and again we'll in i'll include um those answers within uh, the presentation slides so if i just pop back to the presentation now so just to make sure that um oops, sorry just to make sure that everybody has um the same understanding of sustainability so for those people that um that answered no or they don't know around a sustainability strategy the first thing is just to make sure that we've all got that basic fundamental understanding of sustainability so what is sustainability well you may have heard of the three pillars so it's environment it's social and it's economic so in your strategy you need to make sure that you're covering all of these three things so thinking about how does your company or your business impact the environment how does it impact the community and when you're growing in all three of these areas you'll be sustainable. And then the benefits that will come off of that, I'm not going to touch on now because I'm going to leave that to Ian and Grace to, to say in their presentations of, of what they've seen and how um, their, the strategy is helping HE Sim. So for the background and that basic knowledge on what we need to know for developing your strategy, I'm going to take us through a few slides on drivers, issues and enablers. So this is the process that you can follow. So I've got um, this really, really helpful image from the Supply Chain Sustainability School. And if we follow it through, so if we start on the left hand side here, so it's thinking about the drivers, the why. What is driving your business where, um, currently? Is it things like um, clients? Is it cost? And then also thinking about what might be driving your organization in the future. And then how that links into the topics. So the sustainability topics or the issues or the impacts, you might have heard different words um, for, for it. You can see there that there is there's a variety of different ones. So we've got air quality, energy and carbon, business ethics, community, etc. Um, so this is really thinking about what does your organisation do that impacts on the environment, on the community, etc. And then flowing out of that is the enablers, the how. So I'm now going to touch on the drivers and the enablers in a bit more detail. So on the left hand side, we've got the drivers. So we often use this diagram when we're doing a driver's workshop with a client. It will be probably an hour long workshop. Where we really start to discuss and pull out what is it that is driving your business currently? Is it your customer? Is it your cost? You can see the types of drivers that it might be on the left hand side there. Um, and also, as I mentioned earlier, really thinking about what could be driving your organization in the future. So, for example, are you a supplier and is your customer com coming to you and saying, can you provide us with new innovative solutions to, to help us achieve our sustainability commitments? So is innovation perhaps in the next couple of years starting to become a bigger driver for you? So you can start to think there about what's driving us now, what's driving us in the future. On the right hand side, we've got the enablers. So this is really the how. So once you have um, thought about what your drivers are, thought about what your sustainability impacts are, how do you actually then achieve your sustainability goals? So these are some really key enablers that I've put um, on the slide here. So things like enabling people, training and education, upskilling people, making sure that they understand why you're doing what you're doing with sustainability and bringing them along the journey with you. We've got engaging stakeholders that could be clients, suppliers, investors, shareholders, making sure that they have an understanding of what you're doing sustainability wise as well and why you're doing it. And then around setting goals, responsibilities and roles um, that I'll touch on again shortly, but really comes into the detail of how are we um, how are we actually going to achieve what we want to achieve. 
Now, the final one there, measuring and improving performance, um, is a key one. So I'm going to touch on that in this slide here. Once you have decided what your drivers are, what your impacts are, you need to understand how you're currently performing. So you need to baseline your current performance. So on the right hand side there is a plan, do, check, act cycle, which many of you might have seen before, might already be integrated within many of your management processes. But it's really about understanding where our current baseline is and then how we can improve. So understanding where hotspots are, using data to um, inform future decisions, seeing how you compare with your targets, um, and for those that this is this is brand new uh, to, how do you then go about actually collecting information to understand your performance? So you'll see um, on, on the left-hand side, we've got goal, target, indicator, and metrics. So these are very, uh, this, is a, this is a common language that you can use to structure your understanding and your collection of data to see how you're doing performance management wise. So as an example, if I just quickly take you through, a goal could be that you want to reduce the amount of waste that's being sent to landfill. The target is you've set um, within your strategy that you want 90% of waste to be diverted. The indicator for that, um, how you're performing against the target is the percentage of waste diverted. And how you actually um, work out how you're performing, you collect the granular detail, so the total waste diverted from landfill and the total waste generated. So that would, that would be the process that you can follow through to understand performance management. The key thing here is that you don't have to do it all. You remember that slide that I showed you of that diagram um, when there's 15, 16 different sustainability topics? You can't focus on everything or you'll end up focusing on nothing. So you need to prioritise and just identify three or four key impacts that are relevant to you and focus on them, first of all. So as I just draw my, uh, my background part to a conclusion, how that links, how everything that we've spoken about links in with actually tailoring your specific strategy. So what you can do is you can follow this flow diagram through. So if we start at the top, competition, do some research. Do some research to understand what your competitors are doing, what your clients are doing, what does good look like in your market. Then you can identify your drivers and your impacts, which we've touched on, and develop a simple policy with key goals. Now, that can seem quite daunting, but it literally just needs to be a very simple policy with a few key goals on what you want to achieve. Out of that, this is where the detail can come in on creating an action plan. How are you actually going to achieve those key goals? Break it down. What are the short term goals? What are the long term goals? What KPIs do you need to um, establish? what are the roles and responsibilities, who's going to take ownership for delivering certain things and to helping you as a business on that journey. Monitor implementation, well, we'll be hearing from Grace shortly around how HE Sim are, are doing that. Measure, manage and report performance, as we've touched on, collect your baseline, understand what your baseline, how you're currently performing so you know how you can improve. And then that final one there is around continually improving. So as an example, upskilling um, people, training and education is a key one. You want to bring people along that journey with you. But continually improving also links in with everything that we've touched on. So um, improving your performance, understanding the data, and also linking that in with improving your sustainability strategy itself. So with that, I've gone through the background. I'm now going to pass over to Ian, who's going to talk about HE Sim and the journey they've been on to develop their sustainability strategy. Hello everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Ian, I'm Ian Bruce. I'm a operations director for HE Sim. Um, just a bit of background to HE Sim. HE Sim are a mechanical and electrical public health engineering business operating in the construction sector. Uh, we also have a fire and security and facilities management uh, business with offices in Liverpool, London, Manchester and Crawley. We were formed in 1948, the fourth generation, uh, wholly family owned and made up and the board, the family board at the present time is made up of four family members all active in the business. We're top 20 MEP businesses in the UK with a turnover of in excess of 100 million in 2019. 2020 saw us win the CN Awards for MEP Specialist of the Year and Specialist Contractor of the Year, over 25 million. Um, as part of um, what I do as, as Operations Director for the business, I wasn't engaged in sustainability or as I thought, I wasn't engaged in sustainability. Um, I got involved in it as, as part of uh, what I do within the business 
is I'm always looking for continued improvement and trying to reduce waste. One thing I know in our industry, and regardless of what industry you're in, clients will not pay more, regardless of, of what you do, they will not pay more. They'll only pay what they have to pay. And the only way we could become sustainable or taking it back to the goals, economic, as a business, is to do more with less. During my research and uh, into uh, tools I use, um, lean value stream mapping, um, process mapping, collaborative planning, there was a huge alignment with sustainability. Doing more with less, less materials, less labour, equals less carbon, more profit, more investment, more apprentice trained, and so on and so on. And at the end of the day, which leads to better productivity and better communities. So in reverse, really, we, we spoke earlier about what the benefits are. I'm probably come from the other side. I've come from the benefits of, of where um, you end up when you do get a sustainability policy into place. Um, the more I looked and researched improving productivity, nearly always came back to sustainability. We already did an awful lot, as I say, collaborative planning, value stream mapping, waste reduction. We've got a prefab facility. We do a lot um, with an internal external training, workplace training with the armed forces, apprentices, as I'm sure you all do charity work, supporting communities, et cetera, et cetera. But when you start looking at sustainability, we couldn't measure it. And that's how I came into sustainability really, was that I couldn't measure it. So through my work with the sustainability school on lean terms and techniques, I was introduced to uh, action sustainability in Hepplestall. And, and I approached Ian and, uh, for assist assistance with the measurement of what we were already doing. And the question came back to me was, what's your strategy? Now I'm sure there's, there are many different businesses and, and sizes of businesses on this call uh, and, and many different positions in the call. But, but no matter what business or position you're in, if you're assuming, uh, if you're assuming accountability, responsibility for sustainability, you need to fully understand why you're doing it. And you have to have the bill payers, bill payers approval. By this, I mean, you need to have the full backing of the board. If you don't get that, you will struggle. Um, to be honest, at the time, I couldn't clearly answer. I had my thoughts and goals, legislation, moral, clients. Can we afford to do it? Can we not afford to do it? It's a big question you've got to ask yourself. And to get ahead of the rest, to give yourself a USP. But what, but what I wasn't sure of is what the family's aspirations and ambitions were um, around sustainability. So after an initial discussion and guidance from AS, I went um, from actual sustainability, I went away and thought about it. And through Imagine's and Ian's direction, I looked at the UN goals, which were a series of 17 international goals that made up many facets that you can align your strategy with. And that also aligns them with your clients because your clients will be using the UN goals. Um, action sustainability also set me up on a learning path for me on the sustainability school dashboard, which is a simple to use and a good forum to give a high, le high level knowledge. So spend some time researching the different strategies of your clients and your competitors and which you can align with best. You want to be looking for the best possible impacts that you can make directly without reliance on others and with the minimum effort and, and with a very important way that you can measure. It's pointless trying to impact on a subject if you rely on multinationals changing their behaviours or process, i.e. reducing carbon, in, in reducing cardboard in your business but you buy everything off Amazon. You're just not gonna change that. You're not gonna do that. So it's pointless even trying. So, so the things you wanna work on are the things that can make the massive impact in the quickest amount of time. So when, when I first started looking at this and I've still got my notes from it uh, and 
I looked at the concept of it and it was basically, as we said then, was to aim, understand the basic understanding of the topics, look at what legislation's around, look at government guidance, seminar, publications, and things like that. An overview, just get an overview of what your clients are doing. Uh, any competitors use the websites. Most large clients now produce yearly reports and publications. Get clear in your mind why you think you need to do it. Is it legislation? Is it what your clients value? Economic, social, environmental. It's crucial. Is it crucial to your business? And is it crucial to your, to your values? This, and, and a very important thing is to discuss with your staff. Get how they feel about it. And during that process, and I think they sort of want to be involved within it, of the group, and identify possible specialist assistance. If, if you've got to take this, your strategy or your thoughts to the board at some time, I aligned with uh, Action Sustainability and they produced a document for me that showed a roadmap to um, a sustainability strategy. And, and that was, and, and even at that point, that was costed and it gave me a business plan. It gave me the background to a business plan to take that forward to, um, to the family board. I then went to the family board with the concept found findings. And to be honest with you, I got a mixed reception. All okay, but there was definitely a lack of understanding, certainly on how it aligned to improvement. Um, so what I did from there is I set, I set up a group and I, I, I invited them to sit on it. And I called that at the time an operating group. And I asked them initially what, it, what was important to them regarding the three initiatives economic, social, environmental. And I asked them a series of questions around that. Um, and I asked them why, why are we doing this innovation project? What, what is your ambition? And where do you feel we should focus? How, what are the resources we need successfully to deliver this? Leadership, what are the business ambitions? Do you want to be leaders in this? Opportunities and risks. Where can we make the biggest difference? What are our risks if we don't act? Have we got the right people to deliver this? And the measurement, how are we going to measure this? How, how are we going to measure this at, the, at this time? Sorry. And the response came back to me was, we want to be the best. Uh, want to be the best employer. We want to be the best in the communities we work in. We want to be the best for a better future for future generations. And whilst this is all good stuff, um, it's not really a strategy. Does it align with our people, our suppliers, our clients, and how do we measure it? So at this point, again, board approval to engage with action sustainability, and we set out on a, on a discovery action plan. Firstly, what we did was we mapped out all the key objectives of our customers. We mapped out all the key objectives of our competitors. We baselined our current performance where we had information available. And that was sketchy. That, I don't think, I think most of you will go through that, that you think you should have more information than you've got. And that's where it becomes difficult but that's when you when you change your mindset and you start thinking to yourself well maybe the first year's got to be baseline and review the relevant documents and the governance you've got within your business now from that and with the uh, action sustainability we we organized workshops with 14 of our key clients and i was really surprised how many of them interacted with us and came to the workshop and we gained from that, albeit we had the information off the websites, we gained a better understanding of what was driving their values. And we had a better understanding of how we could contribute to their objectives. And we also tested our research on, on what we already had. And, and, and to be honest with you, that helped in starting some long-term communications with these, 
with these clients that are, are, are really are fruitful, not just from the point of sustainability, but they've been really good for the business as well. Another big point is we did internal workshops with internal colleagues. And, and again, we tested the finances of the clients. We found out what made, made the staff click and made them get into it. And we also got another feeling again of the people who wanted to be involved within the, um, within the sustainability group. So once, once we, we started this process, um, Sorry. So we, we then, from that, we then started to look at how we were going to bring this together. So we took all the, the information we received off the clients and we took the very, very high level um, outline issues that they had and, and what we were, thought was important to our business. And we set up five groups. We set up the carbon group a waste and resource group, people, air quality and wellbeing, and communities. And we invited people from within the business to join these groups. These groups then um, collated the data uh, uh, attaining to those, those groups, and they broke it down into further priorities and which they believe where they could make the biggest impact, both from legislation, what was important to clients, and, and just generally got that into smaller. And these were then further broken down into smaller groups again that became action plans. From there, we then produced a um, on anagram of how we were going to manage this. And we produced the five working groups that you can see on the screen now. Those five working, those five focus groups, sorry, report into the working group. Now the working group is made up of the five focus leads. It's made up of our um, uh, procurement uh, manager or director, and it's made up of a H the HR director. That working group meets once a quarter and that reports into the governance group, which is made up of the family board and other key influencers within the business. Within the, what we have done as well that we've found invaluable is that Imogen sits on the working group as a facilitator and facilitates the group, working group meetings and Ian Heppenstall sits as chair on the, the governance group. So, I mean, I know this is, is going through quite quickly, but we launched our strategy in July 21. Of the four phases of the sustainability journey, phase one, discover is complete, with phase two, develop nearing completion and being run in parallel with phase three, deliver. Phase four determines performance against targets, which will include the delivery of annual sustainability report. Current actions from phases two and three that are being delivered include finalising the setup of the sustainability tool to measure the performance against the five key areas, as well as developing competence through, through training and learning plans. We've also got, through Action Sustainability, three surveys going out next year um, to try and capture the knowledge on sustainability that is within the business, within the subcontractors, and what training, what training is required by the staff in order for us then to set up learning pathways. And we're gonna link these learning pathways into job um, descriptions and job chats uh, and, and manage that people are, performers manage people against, against the, um, the job descriptions. Um, the carbon group at, the, at this particular time are focusing their efforts on scope one and two. This includes outstanding our own direct electric use, our fleet use. This, this information will be input into the sustainability tool 
And this will perform, this is what I was saying before, this will form the part of our baseline because we did not have that data. And I'm, uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't have had it, but we didn't have it. And I think you, you can't be frightened of the fact you haven't got it. You, you just need to collate it and get it going. And then throughout, I don't think, probably back end of next year, we'll probably start looking at scope three, which is understanding the emissions from the supply chain. The community group are focusing on their efforts on collecting monthly data on community engagement activities delivered both with HG Signal and within supply chain. The group are leading on the development and guidance of the document on the topic for HG Signal employees. The, docu the document will focus on the visions and commitments recommended in the resource. Guidance through the life cycle, including design, procurement, manufacturing. And once this document is complete, it was shared as a best practice with the other four groups. Air quality, um, being honest with you, it's probably stumbling at the moment. We, we're trying to find good quality air, air monitoring for the business uh, and for the premises. But the, the plan around that is that by the end of January, we should have air quality um, monitoring facilities within all our offices to produce a baseline and a point to work from to improve air quality within the business. Once that's done, then we will start rolling it out to the sites and then we'll start then building it into designs. People group are focusing their efforts on developing a training matrix to determine who should undertake sustainability training and to develop their competence. Through detailed evaluation of job roles and functions, the training matrix will lead to develop specific learning pathways and I want to say too much on the waste group because I know Grace is going to uh, pick up on that but at the present time we've picked two major projects um, both in excess of 10 million that we're, we're, we're baselining our waste on but I'll leave that one for, for, for Grace. Um, I think along the way and um, I'm more than happy for actually sustainability to share our um, strategy with you, um, anybody who wants it, we're more than we've got nothing, we're quite proud of it. Um, we, we, want, we want people to, to learn, and the more people we get involved in this, the better. Lessons learned so far. Um, I think we need to push more on the saving side of it, what sustainability, sustainability brings to the savings within the business. I think sometimes it gets, I noticed on the slide before, I think sometimes it gets lost all in green issues. Um, it's not all about green issues. Um, there's massive savings to be made within the business by just reducing waste. Um, your teams, you need to think about your teams. And if the people aren't right, you need to find them, get the right people into your teams to do it. They've got to be passionate about it. They've got to want it and they've got to drive it. Otherwise, it can't, you can't do it all as one person. It just won't work. Um, and we, we've lost some good, not lost out the business, but certainly lost out the sustainability group, good people in their fields, but just didn't have the commitment to it. You need committed clients. Um, because if you haven't got committed clients, you'll struggle to implement it on your projects. And you need to get your uh, supply chain involved. And stay on track. I think the biggest problem we had was um, was getting derailed, putting strategy, putting ideas in place, and then then coming off them. So really, that for for me is um, I hope I give you an insight. I'm glad to take any questions, and um, that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Ian. And um, as Ian's just said, if you can put any questions that you want to ask Ian into the Q&A box at the bottom and we'll be sharing the slides and also we'll send you a link to HE Sims sustainability strategy itself so you can have a look, look through after the session. Um, yeah, any questions, just pop them in. I do have uh, one question here. Um, the question is... What made you decide to engage with action sustainability as opposed to trying to develop a strategy on your own? Um, I think 
uh, as I alluded to before, I was already involved with the sustainability school and, and I probably thought initially, um, yeah, we can do this. But when I was trying to convince, when I saw the quality of the documents and how, it's going to sound uh, not simple, but how well mapped out it was, how action sustainability were going to take us through that process. It was a no brainer. I think it would have cost us a lot more money and a lot more wasted effort if we had tried to do it ourselves. Don't get me wrong, a lot of the work has to be done by yourselves, but it keeps you on track and I'd have no hesitation in doing the same again. Thanks, Ian. Um, next question is your groups were made up of senior staff in that diagram that you were explaining with the five groups. How did and how do you engage with your workforce? Um, the five focus groups aren't made up of senior staff. In fact, the focus groups, three of them are made up of um, people under 30. And, and certainly uh, there's two. One technical apprentice is looking after one of the groups. One junior engineer is looking after one of the groups and a... Um, I hate the one of the um, HR staff is looking after another group. The uh, air quality and well-being is looked after by a senior member of staff, and the carbon group is looked after a senior member of staff mainly because they had access, or we thought it would be easier with them having access to the fleet and the, um, the subcontract ledgers. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Ian. Um, I see another couple of questions, but we'll uh, answer them if we've got time at the end. And now I want to move on to Grace and Grace's presentation, because obviously Ian's given us a high level overview and Grace is now going to give us a presentation um, on the details. So over to you, Grace. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Grace Wilson. I am the technical apprentice at HGSIM. I'm just going to share my screen for you now. Uh, just to give you a bit of background, um, I'm currently, we work in rotations and I'm currently on the on-site rotations. So I'm working on site at uh, New Victoria in Manchester um, and it consists of two apartment blocks made up of uh, 25 storeys and then 20 storeys. Um, within the business I am involved in the communities group but mainly the waste um, and resource group so I've been doing quite a bit of work on site to try and push that forward. Um, so I'll start with what I've been doing with the waste group. So I've been heading up a case study, like almost like a research project, and um, we've titled it Prevention Before Production. And we, we did this as a baseline because we wanted to know what, where our waste was coming from and what, it, what, we, what actions we could take to reduce that. So I'm just going to talk through some of our objectives and what we're taking to get to where we want to be. So some of our objectives were to take accountability and recognise our excess waste production to accurately measure the amount of waste produced from an M&E contractor because we couldn't find anything doing research, we couldn't see any to do with M&E specifically, so we thought why not do it ourselves. And um, We want to reduce the amount of materials delivered on site and uh, create a sustainable process. We want to reduce on-site on -site waste production to a mi minimum and uh, promote reusability and recycling wherever we can. Um, continuously encourage a sustainable mindset within our supply chain and overall just have a lean approach to work. Have a lean approach to work, saving time and resources across our business. So our action plan. Now, this is quite, this is going to take us quite a while. It's going to take about eight months to go through it. So we're at the very beginning phases of it, but um, we're working with Vinci, who is the main contractor on, at New Victoria. Um, and they're really on board and getting loads of support. So even though we are in the early stages, it's going quite well. Um, so the way New Victoria works, levels one to 25 are identical all the way up. So all the same. So we thought this is a great opportunity to really see what waste we're producing and also how the improvements we can make. So our first step on level one, we met with all our supply chain and subcontractors and we asked them to save every single bit of waste produced at all, like that is packaging. So when we split it up into cardboard, hard plastic, soft plastic, metal, and uh, just a general waste bin as well. Um, so the first step we did was we, we collected every single bit of waste over three weeks and kept it in a specific lay down area and split that out. Next, we, uh, we've only done this in the past couple of weeks is uh, we hired an A-frame wire and we have uh, accurately weighed every single bit of waste. And from that, 
we've also calculated things like the landfill space and costs associated with that. The next step, um, which we are currently in the process of, is we are li liaising with our supply chain, also manufacturers, both up and downstream, to see what changes we can make and what steps we can take to reduce it. Uh, then we will be implementing our actions. Um, one of these actions, for example, is um, we are replacing with our suppliers all cardboard boxes with reusable crocodile boxes. So heavy duty plastic boxes that we will get on the table. So we'll have two sets. We'll have a set and our suppliers will have a set. So they will get delivered to site. We will put the materials in our stores, retain the empty boxes, and it will work on a cycle sort of system. And that already is massively reducing the amount of cardboard that we, uh, we are getting on site. So prevention before production, stopping it getting here in the first place. And then once we've got our results, we're going to go to, when we get to level five, once we've implemented all these actions and been doing it for a while, uh, we're going to recollect and remeasure all our waste that we have produced. And from this, we're going to compare our results, see what worked, any lessons learned, and carry that them successes on throughout the project. So just a few figures. So these, this is just a little picture of how, at the very beginning, we were just keeping these tum bags, putting all the waste in so nothing was going missing. So in total, there was 18,122.50 uh, kilograms, and that we predicted that for the entire project. So we took the measurements from level one, and then we times that by 45 to get the average amount of waste. And this is for apartments only. This is not including any kind of landlord areas, ground floor, excess waste. So this was apartments only. And as you can see, it's a big, big number. Um, so we need to aim to get that down as much as possible. Um, approximately, it was around 270 metres cubed of landfill space. Now, this is not compressed, taken into the compression factor, but even then, it is a very, very big number, uh, and around £7,480 in skip higher. Right. So our goals for 2020 is to strengthen our supply chain relationships and attitudes towards sustainability. So carrying on with our actions, as you can see in the picture, this is a meeting we've been having monthly with Vinci Construction. Um, and they are very supportive of our goals and it really want us to see to see us do well and see how much uh, waste we can actually reduce on site. Um, this is to work towards our goal of being a zero avoidable waste organisation by 2030. And we also want to continuously save resources, energy, time and money through proper actions and efforts. Um, so it's going well so far, but as I said, we are in the early days, but already everyone seems is very, very enthusiastic and I've been, I've been saying like there's no reason not to do it, especially with waste, because it saves everyone time, it saves everyone money, it helps the environment, it saves resources. Like the, the, I can't see a downside um, towards pushing waste management on your sites. Um, I just think it's a really good thing to get behind and push for your business. Um, so the other group I'm involved in is the communities group or CSR, so our community social responsibility as well. Um, so I am the CSR lead on New Victoria. Um, so every month I will collect um, the information from New Victoria, such as how many apprentices we've got on site, that is from subcontractor and internally, um, how, if we've done any community activities, any volunteer hours, anything like that, and we'll report it into the tool just so we can see our information. And we've also got um, an action plan in place. Now, these are our aims and objectives for the community group. So I think it's interesting to say as well that each of these objectives as an individual person dedicated to them. Um, so the six people in the communities group, myself, I am um, this one here. So I have put together a, a register that keeps track of all the communities that we operate in. And I created a location opportunities register. So it has things like where's the nearest food bank? What's the closest charity? What's the greatest area? What's the greatest area of deprivation that might need help? Just so you've got that information on hand in case any kind of opportunities could arise. Um, some other things that we've been doing is uh, develop, develop a social value framework so we can actually accurately record data, as I said before, like apprentices, supplier diversity uh, and train them. Uh, we want to incorporate social value actions to be taken in all project plans and timelines. So this is Paul, our planner um, for New Victoria and for a lot of other sites across our jobs. Uh, and in the planning stages of our projects now, we are incorporating social value and social responsibility. So it's not just pure construction, it, is, um, it spans across the board. 
and um, we are engaging with our supply chain and social enterprises uh, this is to avoid duplication because obviously we have lots of different subcontractors on different jobs so keeping everyone in the loop avoids that kind of repetition and keeps everyone on board without them getting like like annoyed or like feeling like they've been pestered about certain things so if you feel you keep the communication and your aims and objectives really out in the open people get on board um we're providing more training towards for HE Sim and HESA staff to strengthen um, our workforce. And then we also engaging with site teams and clients, as I said, with their uh, waste management, providing support and volunteering efforts. Um, an example would be on New Victoria, uh, LifeShare are doing um, a homeless charity event in um, which we are donating the site stores for five days over Christmas, providing food and shelter for five days. So we've got quite a few people from HG Sim who are volunteering to go in over Christmas, spend their own time um, providing that support. Um, what we've achieved so far in the community group, we have our social value framework. So we are now currently inputting data and collecting that baseline. Um, we are processed for research and projects as the one I've got. So even now when we tender, we're already looking at social value before we even start. Um, so it's a really it's really good to get in there early and understand what it is you can do. Um, we've got track and spend. We've been recording data and inputting the supply tools and learning our pathways. So some some things what we've encountered so far. This is up until October, um, and we only started counting in I think it was September. So we've only done two months so far, but we've logged two thousand one hundred and fourteen apprentice hours, and that's across ten apprentices um, within our business. Uh, we've donated six thousand. £55 to charity. We've uh, done 79 community volunteer hours, 114 local employees and 1,120 donated to community projects. Um, so already it's great to just see the numbers because I feel especially with um, charity work and uh, apprentice hours and things like that, it's something you just do and it never gets really logged or anything like that and you can't really like, you know, like put it in a chart and say like this is what we've done, this is what we could do better, this is what we can do. So it's really helpful just to be able to see it on the screen like this. And our goals in the community group for 2022 is to set specific targets for each project. So we go in with a clear mind, we know what we want to achieve but in terms of social value, how can we better the communities that we are going into because construction is quite disruptive. So what can we give back to these local communities? We want everyone in the business and in our supply chain to understand the framework and consider new ideas and initiatives and how can we engage people and keep them on board and keep the, um, the enthusiasm forward going. Um, we want to add questions to the PQQ process and um, process. So when we interview for subcontractors, we want them to be on board with our values as well. Um, we want CSR report and colleagues fully trained for each site. So we want a dedicated person for every single site to be our CSR champion, not only for us, but also to report back to the main contractor and try and get them on board, go through the supply chain and just really get everyone on board with this. And um, we want to make an impact to new clients have a positive impact everywhere we go and produce at least two case studies, one of which is the waste management, which we are working on. Um, so hopefully uh, all goes well. It should be should be a good good piece of work and good um, set out some good goals and we can really, really get some good actions from that. Um, so that is all from me. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll hand you back to Imogen. I can stop sharing. Thanks so much, Grace. Um, so what's really nice, and hopefully everyone else has kind of followed this on the webinar, is that we've gone from right that high level that Ian's mentioned of why they've why HE Sim have gone through and decided to go with the strategy. And you follow and remember that diagram I showed you at, at the beginning of the kind of the, the seven steps, follow it all the way around. And then you've got that monitor implementation bit that Grace is talking about, what they're doing on the ground, they're measuring the performance, understanding the baseline so then they continue to improve. So it's HE Sim are perfect case study of developing and delivering and tailoring their strategy to themselves. Um, so we do have some questions coming in specifically for Grace before we open up for any questions for Ian as well. So this question uh, for you specifically, Grace, is you mentioned logging social efforts on a tool. Is this an in-house tool you developed or something from Action Sustainability? Uh, this is from Action Sustainability. So um, we've been having regular meetings with Imogen deciding on what matrix we want to base it on. Um, so for the waste side, it was how do we want to measure the waste like how far do we want to split it out and um, what detail do we want to go into and on the community side it was things like apprentice hours um money raised um 
volunteer hours given and stuff. Um, so we've had several meetings uh, with Ian, Imogen and Ian um, on this tool. And then Imogen and Ian have created it and we use it and input into it. And then we get a feedback every month on how we've done. And then the slide that you shared with your stats from October is yeah. the output of that. It is. It is. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, um, there's a few questions that are linked here around supply chain. Um, so the first question is, how much engaging do you do, and this is specific for waste, sorry, how much engaging do you do with your supply chain? Has there been any ideas from your team or from the supply chain on how the waste can be reduced? It's kind of two questions in one there. Um, yeah, we've been engaging a lot. I've um, never spoken to them so much, to be honest. Um, no, we've been, they've been coming to site. We had um, we had all of our uh, subcontractors, uh, the managers, we, we brought them to site. And when we measured level one, we showed them, we laid it all out and we had a big uh, meeting with Vinci as well. Um, and we showed them all the waste laid out and we went, right, this is what we produced. We need some ideas on how we can reduce it. Um, and we had a lot of brainstorming ideas. And I use this example all the time, but one of the main things is um, as MEP, if we want to install, say, a light switch when it gets delivered, it's in each individual light switch is it wrapped in a plastic bag with a separate instruction leaflet in a cardboard box. And we are installing thousands of light switches which do not need an individual instruction leaflet for each, because you hope that you'd be able to fit it without it. Um, so we're talking now with also manufacturers, so people like Ventaxia, Ozo, things like that, to see if we are ordering in bulk, how can it be packaged in bulk? Because the way we order now, it gets delivered, like you just walked into a shop and picked it off a shelf. You know what I mean? So it's um, how can we um, better that and kind of go upstream and kind of cut out all that excess packaging, which is just completely unnecessary. Um, so yeah, we've been having regular meetings with all our supply chain and I've got, um, I'll send over to Imogen the slides um, and our report, what we're making, because we've received their letters of support as well from a lot of our suppliers um, saying like what they wanna, what they wanna do and how they wanna help us. Um, but another action that we're taking, as I said, is the crocodile boxes um, where we are making, getting rid of any kind of excess cardboard and that. And then also we are doing a lot of prefabrication on New Victoria, as I said, with our new um, offsite um, sector. And on top of that, we have been working with Polypipe, um, who have been prefabbing all our SVP and rainwater pipes. And we've been speaking with them and they said any kind of off cuts or like the end caps that we don't need, they can be retained to Polypipe to be melted down and reused. So we're in the very beginning processes of just discussing that and seeing how can we fully have no waste on this site. And then um, I'm also setting up a meeting with uh, Kenny's, I believe, who is our um, waste management for OMB. So OMB is our logistics manager on New Victoria and they deliver all the waste to Kenny's uh, to sort it out. So I'm gonna be visiting Kenny's um, to see just how it's being split out, what's going to recycle, what's going to landfill um, and what can we do to assist them on that. That's brilliant, thanks. And then just linked to that, because it seems like you've got a good amount of engagement with the supply chain it's all going quite well you've got the list of support have you faced any challenges with the supply chain so far and if so how have you kind of got over that I have um not it's more just skepticism in it I've had a lot especially um people think like oh it's a waste of time like what we're doing this is just just uh, people pleasing and stuff like that but once you sit them down and go through it and say so no this is actually the amount of waste that we have produced this is how we can reduce it and just how much we can reduce it by and as I said before we're saving us money we're saving them money we're saving everyone time there's no reason not to so once you kind of explain it to them and get through the whole oh it's just like tree hugging kind of um aspect of it they, they do get on board I, I've seen um some people believe like we've cut it down as much as possible like we've done what we can we can't go any further but I think you can always go a bit further you just gotta put your heads together sit down and just really discuss and see think outside the box what can you do that's brilliant thank you um so we've got about five minutes left so I'm going to open up the floor for any questions that you've got for Ian as well so do pop them into the Q&A box um there is one question uh coming through for Ian here um and it's uh, have you shared your strategy with your clients and what's the response been from your clients around your strategy? Um, yes, we have shared the um, 
especially with the clients. And uh, on the whole, um, from certainly with the clients we engage with prior to producing the strategy, it's all been very, very positive. Um, would I say we've had a great deal of feedback from others outside that? Probably not at the moment. Um, but what has happened is that we have found now that end clients are coming to us direct, not through a main contractor. So we are getting end clients talking to us about it uh, and, and how we can help them in their initial inquiries um, to get the right message out to the uh, within the tenders and certainly within the PQQs. So yeah, on, on the whole, from uh, key clients, all very positive. From a point of view of generating further business, I would say that has probably come more from end clients and developers. Okay, that's brilliant, thank you. Um, as I said, any more questions, do pop them in the chat box. Uh, the next one here is for Grace, um, and it's how, uh, as you're working in the waste in the community groups, um, how do you deal with any colleagues or employees that might not be engaged from um, your perspective? From what the groups have been in so far, everyone's been really engaged, to be honest. Um, and it says a lot, seeing as it's not really part of our day jobs as per se. Um, but everyone who I'm working with seems really enthusiastic, um, like really up for it. And we've been having... I think it's like bi-weekly meetings and they're only 15 minutes long, but um, especially with the community group, we've been having these meetings and um, just to catch up with everyone and see like how's it going and what to do. And I think just that 15 minutes, it doesn't dominate your day, it doesn't take up too much time, but it's still keeping people engaged um, and keeping them focused on what it is we need to do. But it's been really positive for me so far. That's great. Thank you. Um, and then the next question is for Ian again um, so again just linking to that structure that you showed around those five working groups do you find that the five working groups are um, sorry let me just read this question do you find that the five working groups um, cross over very much or do they all interact separately um, they cross over quite a lot to be honest with you and, and I think through your strategy you, you've got to you've got to align that um, certainly when we were doing the development and the discovery stages, we found that there was a lot of overlap between, between the groups. Um, the groups are quite overlapped anyway, as Imogen, as um, Grace said then, uh, Grace is involved at different levels within two groups. And you, you find that, that um, within some of the groups, people operate across two groups. Um, and each week on a Monday, um, and I meet with the, the heads of the groups. And again, it's only a 15 minute meeting. In fact, that's probably been the longest one. Um, <clears throat> just, to, just to see if there's any issues, just if there's any help they need off me, anything um, pressing that they need, anything they need off the family. Uh, and really just that 15 minutes, it's not a, a download or a, a, a session where we get into any detail, but I think, as Grace touched on then, those 15 minutes once a week are invaluable. You know, it, it, it just keeps everybody on focus. They know they've got to come to the meeting and just, um, and, and you, get a, you get a feeling if, if every week you go and somebody just sits there and says nothing, you get a feeling that things aren't quite right. So, and we bring out many, really any overlaps in that because it's an open forum and they all speak freely. So, so I think that's how we've got over the overlaps really. Um, it's just about 15 minute meeting. So just about keeping them engaged um, yeah. and, and reporting if there's any, if they need any help, any, anything going well they want to share. So that, that ongoing communication piece. Yeah, yeah, and just, just keeping everyone, the biggest thing is keeping everyone engaged and, and, and if they've got any problems and, and, and you, you just cut it off early, don't you? And, and it may mean that I have to take something away or one of the heads of one of the other groups has to take something away um, and then come back the following week. Um, uh, and, and, and it just flushes anything out, really. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, well, we're on time now. So um, as we just draw this to a close, um, you'll be sent uh, the, we have a, a copy of the recording and the slides. I'll also send you HE Sims um, strategy in full detail so you can have a look at that. Hopefully you've found this webinar helpful to understand where you can come from right from the very beginning. So understand what is it that's driving your organization currently? What's your main impacts? What's gonna help you in that journey? Um, how do you measure? How do you manage your performance? What's your baseline? And then how can you improve from there? So really about understanding where you are currently and where you need to improve on. So I'd just like to say thank you so much to Grace and Ian. That's been really helpful. Hopefully everyone else on the call has found it helpful as well to get an inside perspective of HECIM, what exactly they've done to develop their strategy. Um, so, and also just like to say thank you very much everyone for joining uh, and we'll leave it there. Thank you.